Tonight I'm going to St. Croix Falls, Wisconsin to do Dancing Dragonfly Winery, and it's an hour away, and I'm going to pick up the feature act at least call right now. Oh, here she comes. She was ready. She was ready. Right when I got here, she was ready. Take note features from my other vlogs. Hey, how's it going? Good, how are you? Good, yeah, right off the bat. This is Elise Cole. Hi! The feature for tonight. Have you ever done a gig like this before? Yes, but I've never featured before. At the winery? No, I've never featured before. Oh, never? No. <laughs> <laughs> never? No, I mean, I have 30 minutes, but... Right, okay. But I've been doing them 15 here, 15 ah. here, 15 here, 15 here. Well, perfect. Here, here you go. Yeah. So, way to be, you know, filmed during your first... <laughs> No pressure. How long have you been doing comedy now? This is the beginning of my third year. Third year. Yeah. And you've been emceeing mostly. Yes. What made you want to start doing stand-up comedy? It had, was my lifelong dream, but I didn't think it was like a thing that people got to do. And I was... Why I, not? I don't know, because I didn't know how to get into it. It's like, how do you get from, I've never done stand-up before, to Richard Pryor? I was working at the restaurant one night. The first customer in my section was this guy who was like an original company member at the Brave New Workshop back in the 70s. And we just started chatting, and he was asking me, like, you know, about my life and my interests, and, and somehow comedy came up, and, um, long story short, he asked me if I'd ever done stand-up, and I said, no, I mean, it's only, like, my life's dream, but I'm not doing anything about it and he said well I think I think you've got the chops to do it and if you want to if that's your calling I think you should and I'd love to you know buy you a cup of coffee and kind of tell you what I know and he just sort of gave me the push that I needed to get into it and so he had me like he gave me assignments like go back and look at your your favorite bits and and pay attention to you know how they're structured I started doing comedy when my son was only about 18 months old and um, it was easier when he was little because he would he would sleep from 7.30 to 7.30 and so we could like finish up dinner and I'd put him to bed and then I'd leave for an open mic and, um, and then not have to worry about anything. And it's different now because he's older so he's staying up later and he doesn't sleep as well. And so getting finding open mics that I can get to is a little bit more challenging. But I, was, I started out going to like five open mics a week at least. Nice. You still like do? No. Because of, because of the kid. Because my marriage can't sustain it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll see you. I'm going to be gone for a couple hours. Good well, luck. That's interesting because when I started doing stand-up comedy, I was 22. I didn't get married until I was 32. I think that there, it's something to be said about the free time. When you're a kid, I would, I would do seven nights a week, multiple times a week, and there was nobody to answer to. How do you think, uh, how do you, well, first off, how do you think that affects you now having a kid and a husband and, like, how, how do you deal with that, trying to get as much exposure and as much practice as you can? So, instead of going to an open mic every single night of the week, there are a couple that I always go to and I never miss, because I think they're a great place to kind of gauge where my material is at. And unless I have a show coming up, like, and there's stuff that I want to really work on polishing and tightening, then usually the week before I have a couple shows, I'll go to an open mic almost every night and just get in the habit of saying what I want to say and practice saying it out loud. We rely on, on our parents. My in-laws will, you know, feed us dinner on Monday night so that I can get down to Acme and then all my husband has to take care of is just giving, giving our kid a bath and putting him to bed. Um, and I try not to, like, leave with no meal plans or no help set up if I'm going to be gone four or five nights a week. Do you, uh, do you fall into any of, like, the social network of open micers? Or? It's weird. Like, I'm, I'm, I just turned 37 and I'm married and I have a kid and so I'm like 15 years older than everybody who's at most of the open mics and just at a completely different place in my life. And I don't, I don't drink. I've been sober for 13 years and so it's like, well, if you don't drink and you don't do drugs and you're married and you have a kid, like, what is, I don't know, what are we going to talk about? <laughs> Went to Valley Fair with a bunch of younger comics because I was like I need to get out there and be more social and then I was like the only one it turns out that wasn't doing acid oh my god <laughs> well just in time we are just pulling up to the winery <laughs> can you Perfect. smell the Merlot yeah I take five hours to prepare for high maintenance baby Oh, 
going into the green room. Oh, I was looking for you. Oh. <laughs> you just doing jumping jacks in here? We got a free buffet, which is cool, and uh, I, Elise is eating out at a table with a bunch of people. I'm a weirdo. I don't like being seen before a show. It's not some weird Diana Ross thing, don't make eye contact with me. It's just everybody stares at you and asks you weird questions before the show, and I feel like if they see the way I walk, they're not going to like me as much as a comic when I get up on stage. I walk like a duck, and uh, I feel that judgment. Look at Elise living my worst nightmare without fear. So this is my opener, Paddington Bear. <laughs> you want a light? Uh, yes. And when do you want it? 25. 25, okay. And don't do less than 30, because I have to do an hour, and then I have to pick up your time if you don't oh, do it. okay, no. But I'm not worried about doing less than 30. I mean, my, my problem is that I'm a chatterbox, that I can't ever shut up. You're not worried about me going over there. I'm not going to get super tense. I mean, that was the thing is like, how do I do this and not go over 30? I time it out just right then. I should come well, well, let me put it this way. If you go over, I don't care, but I think as far as the training that goes into being an, a new feature and setting the precedent, you should probably stick to 30 because yeah. you should just learn that because some headliners do care. Well, this will be a fun crowd. They're, I've been here before. They're really nice. They're very like, they want to, to laugh. Lucky jacket, lucky shoes. You read all your lucky clothes? Yeah. Of course, if I eat it tonight, all of this is getting burned. <laughs> Have a good one. Hello, how are you? The green room door is literally right by the stage, like right next to the stage. So every time I have to go to the bathroom or go out, set up my camera or do something, everybody stops and stares at me instead of who's on stage. And it's super, it, it, it's really disorienting. And I'm just like, don't look at me, I'm invisible, don't look at me. But usually I don't do that. I don't Before I started kindergarten, he pulled me aside and was like, Look, anybody asks if you're Mexican, just say yes. Are you ready to see your headliner? Yeah. There you go. I'm super excited to bring you up. My favorite person to roadie with, an all around good guy, please welcome to the stage, with another round of applause, your headliner this evening, Mike Brody. I, uh, I love that pre-show you're in, that post-show you're in, that. How do you feel about the show? Overall, I'm gonna give it, I'm gonna give it an A for a first. The material needs work, the joke writing needs work, that stuff can always get better, but the fact that I came out on time and I didn't forget any of the setups or callbacks and people laughed, I think it was good. Show's over. I lost Elise. I guess I'm just going home alone. You ready? Yes. Her set was really good. Uh, it seemed really cohesive. Except it that at the end, I was I was just watching your set, so I was sitting at a table in the back yeah. and forgot that I was supposed to go back up there and close out the show. Oh, you were... so I was just clapping with everyone else. I was like, "Yeah, my pretty. All right." I saw you, and I thought you just didn't know. No, I just forgot. I was like, this is fun. I'm excited. What was interesting, like the difference between the show tonight and the one that I did on Wednesday, and this is really hard to kind of put your finger on. It's more of a feeling than anything definitive that happens. But tonight I just felt like a comic. Like there were two comedians. There was me and then there was you. But the show on Wednesday night that I emceed, it was me and three other men and it just felt very clear that I was the only female comedian there and I don't know how to explain exactly what that feels like except that it, you, you can just
just kind of tell that you're starting at a deficit. And maybe some of that is that you're the MC and people kind of go, oh, you're the warm up. We don't need to pay attention to you. But sometimes I think it definitely has to do with me being a woman and that people don't take that seriously. Why do you like, think it was different tonight? I don't know. It maybe is, maybe is the crowd. I think if there are more women in the audience, maybe. Right. Or the age or the area. Like you ever like people? I've seen people bring up women as MC as an MC, and they'll go, "Your next is a comedian." Oh yeah. Like why is why do we need to put a gender on that? A comedian's a comedian. That's what I think, but I'm I'm amazed at how. Well, they'll say she's this next comic's very lovely. Yeah. Like that's think... weird. <laughs> I'd prefer. You to wouldn't be say that about Gary. To be. You know. Funny. Yeah, it's I've been to open mics before where I'm the only female comic there, but I don't notice because when I walk in and I see other comedians, I'm thinking, I sort of, I mean, I categorize them, but sort of in terms of like, who's been doing this longer than me and who's been doing this about the same amount of time as me, who are the comedians that I think are funny, who are the comedians that I don't think are funny, but I, but it is never about who are the female comics or or drawing lines racially or religiously or by anything else. It's like, are you, are, how good are they at the craft? But I have had guys come up to me and go, you're the only woman here. And they have to point it out because I didn't notice. I'm thinking about comedians. I'm not thinking about being the female comic in the room. And I hate that there is a qualifier on it, but that seems to be something that in a lot of places is unavoidable, that I'm not just a comic, I'm a female comic. When you're on stage, you look so comfortable that I would never have known. I would have guessed that you've been doing comedy like six years. No, well, I think part of that is uh, a lot of what made starting comedy easier is um, I've been waiting tables for 20 years. Being in front of people and talking to people and having to think on my feet and being able to keep the conversation uh, moving. And there's, a, I think, a rhythm to, to that. And when you work in a restaurant like even if you're not talking to your table they can they can see you the whole time that you're out on the floor you kind of have to be on and in a serving shift that's six straight hours okay. and I just don't I just don't have stage fright I just don't get it doesn't make me uncomfortable to be in front of to be that visible it was awesome you're awesome first you're feature awesome. gig in the bag Woo! boom it was a huge success high five high five good job we will work together again Great. i will i will bring you when i can i don't always get to bring people when i do get to bring people i will you will be on the list okay great you're awesome awesome right, thank thanks. you just dropped elise off she's really good sometimes comics don't compliment each other enough but i definitely see elise as being a comedian that's gonna go a lot of places because she's really funny she's got a good work ethic she tries hard. She's a good joke writer. Stage presence off the charts. Um, I definitely see her being like a comic to watch. So now there's a blizzard coming and I'm going to try to get home, go to sleep. Tomorrow I have a show in Iowa in Lake Park, wherever that is. It is Saturday morning. I have a gig tonight in Lake Park, Iowa, three hours away, and I have to fill an hour and a half. I just found out that I'm the only comic on the bill, and I can do an hour and a half. I've done an hour and a half before. I can do more than that, but I really don't want to. That is a lot of time, and it's really exhausting, and I'm tired. So I'm trying to find an opener to do like 25 in front of me, and I'm specifically trying to find a newer person who maybe hasn't done a feature gig before or hasn't done many so I can give somebody some experience because that's what people did to me when I started off, and that's how I learned how to do comedy and specifically work road gigs. I haven't found anybody. A lot of people can't do it. A lot of people are booked or doing a showcase in town or an open mic already. And also there's a snowstorm coming, so they might be freaked out by that. So I am striking out. I'm like 0 for 6. Sorry to the person that I'm going to get to do this, that you're going to know that you were like the 8th choice. But I'm sure you're fantastic, whoever you are. I'm going to pick up the middle act right now. Comedy has so much to do with luck. Like, this was like a last minute thing, and I just messaged some people asking if they were open and this person just happened to be open in like five hours or a few hours before the gig and now it's happening and really it's all about like what kind of job you do do you have kids do you have family like there's so many situations other than being funny it's like being able to be available on the drop of a hat which isn't always fair to everybody because if you do have a kid you can't just abandon everything and go on a gig I mean you can but 
heard this guy doesn't wear a seatbelt, so I'm a little bit nervous. Because I'm going to tell him he has to wear a seatbelt. And then if he says no, then we're not, he's not coming with. Hey, man. Hey, how you doing? Too bad yourself? Good, good. Can you get my message? Ooh. Yeah, of course. That's hey, fine. yeah, that's totally fine, man. This is Zach. Hey, how's it going? You ready? Yes, I am ready to rock and roll. What do you got here? Headphones. Hey, did you put your seatbelt on? Of course. You cut your beard? I cut my beard, yeah. It used to be about down here. I cut it for work because I thought, you know, I need to look more professional. How many uh, feature gigs have you done? Um, I'd say a handful, like five or six. You were available at the last minute. Do you do that for comedy? Do you, do you try to like free up your nights so that you can do some last minute stuff or is it just a coincidence? Uh, well, it's, it, tonight was more of a coincidence, but like I definitely, like anytime I have the opportunity to go out and work, I think that you should, you know what I mean? Yeah. When I started off, I waited tables during the day. No. And purposely, every once in a while I would do nights if I had to, but um, yeah. I would purposely try to schedule myself during the day because then I would have nights free yeah, for comedy. comedy yeah. And then it inspired me to get more gigs because it was very not lucrative, but no. I was I was pretty determined from the beginning. What is the end goal for you for comedy? Oh my god, dude, it's such a good question. Um, it's It's never really been to like... You know, like, there's the upper levels of stardom that I think a lot of people probably shoot for naively. But for me, it's just like, man, I want to, like, do the road dog work for, like, a long while. Um, I, I think the overall goal is I've had so many fucking shitty jobs. I never want to have to punch into a time clock again. That's really the end game is to just be able to pay my live bills and live comfortably. I mean, you know, not extravagantly, but comfortably enough just by entertaining people. At what point did it, like, click for you? Like, what rung of the ladder did you feel like you were finally, like, you know, I'm not, I'm above open micer, okay, now I'm, I should be getting paid feature, and, and, and at what point did you just start doing comedy, just only comedy? I, from the very beginning, was like, I want to do this for money. Not because it was, like, not fun for me, but I was like, it was like, I want this to be my job. I love this right. so much that I don't want to work a day job, right. and I want to do this. So I would say three or four years in is when I started working professionally. But really what happened was I was doing, my friend and I drove five and a half hours down to Cedar Rapids, Iowa from Minneapolis. We did an open mic. There was a headliner there that saw me. He was impressed that we drove that far just to do an open mic. He started having me open for him in Minneapolis in the surrounding areas, like Faribault and stuff. Yeah. And sometimes I got zero, sometimes I got 20 bucks. I didn't care. I knew that it was good experience. It's I would do my longer set, longer set, longer set. And then one day without him, I didn't even know this was like a possibility. He dropped my name to the biggest booker in the Midwest at the time. And uh, I started working for them, and that was it. So nice. that person had so many weeks at the time that suddenly I was, you know, able to quit my job. I was making a living three or four years in as a comic, but if you were a 40-year-old comic who was just starting, you wouldn't be able to survive on what I was making. I was making like twelve thousand dollars a year yeah. as an opening act comic, you know. Yeah. But I had no no wife, no house. I had, you know, bills were minimal at that time, yeah. and so I just lived in what I guess you could call poverty, but it didn't feel like poverty because right. I was making my own way. Ah. Shit. <laughs> this is bad. <laughs> right, I know. All right, we just went through a giant blizzard going 23 yeah, miles per hour. Still going. We made it three minutes before the show. We were supposed to get here an hour early. Like that's what right, we left to get here an hour early. Okay. Zach's drinking because he got nervous being the passenger. I got sketched out <laughs> just sitting there. Okay. Yeah, I got it. Yeah, good. Kill this set like you almost died for it. I, you know I will. Because <laughs> you know I did. <laughs> you ready? Yeah. Awesome. Maybe right. just do a little <laughs> I don't know how we do it. Hey. I'm really glad I didn't do this show by myself because I would not want to do an hour and 30 in front of the 12 people that showed up in a blizzard. <laughs> and also I need somebody to push my car out of the ditch. But I got a little bit sad because I got some heartbreaking news, some shit that, lives near, that hit me right where I live. Apparently, the Pawn Stars have been canceled. We got here like three minutes before the show was supposed to start. Our GPS, when we left, we were scheduled to get here an hour before the show. It is 
really coming down. All right. Here at the Father Tom Show, and he drove me through a blizzard successfully. Ladies and gentlemen, please get it up for the very funny Mike Brody. Everybody. We are literally going to have people push us out because we're stuck. Look at this. Well, we don't know that we're stuck. It's likely that we're stuck. Um, they never had this part in Band of Brothers. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. And then we might have to get a hotel in Spirit Lake, which is not in the plan, but uh, what are you going to do? We're going to cuddle, man. Oh, God. How do you feel about the show? You like it, it? It was good, man. It was good. I love local yokels, man. Good times. <laughs> there was not a lot of people there because we were in a legit blizzard. We just got pushed out of the snow by, what, seven people? Yeah. And we're going to drive to Spirit Lake, Iowa, which is not the way we came in. And we're going to contemplate getting a hotel, but if it's clear, we're going to keep going because I'm hoping that it's just a little angle that we got in, yeah, like a little, like a little area. pocket or something. I'm very stubborn and I like sleeping in my own bed. It's You're standing there all children of the corn. <laughs> oh, I forgot to unlock the doors. We were driving, going to decide to get a hotel in Spirit Lake or not. They plowed the roads for a point, so we decided to just go home. It's slow going. We're probably going to get home at like 3 or 3.30, but better than nothing. Okay, it's 3.30 in the morning. I'm back in Minneapolis. I survived the gig. I don't know how. I kind of put my life at risk to do that gig, but it was nasty. They had to push us out of the parking space. Zach actually had to run after the car and jump into it while it was moving because if I stopped, I would get stuck again. In one piece. I did it. If you want to check out my Dry Bar Comedy Special, check out the link below. Go to also MikeBrewery.com. Check it all out. Don't drive in a blizzard. It's stupid. Have a good night. Thanks, guys.